Good morning. Great to see everyone this morning. So full disclosure here, when uh, Glenn asked me if I could fill the pulpit this morning, I, I didn't look at the calendar, but uh, you guys are, are lucky that Glenn stepped up and Josh stepped up because I was actually on tap to do the welcome song leading and preach this morning. So I can hear somebody at some point saying, good grief, <laughs> when are we going to get, we get done with this? So, but then I looked at the calendar, I recognized I, I maybe still got the short end of the stick because many of you were at Affirming the Faith this weekend with uh, some of the Brotherhood's best speakers, and I have to measure up to that, and then on top of it, everybody lost an hour's worth of sleep, and some of us are challenged anyway to stay awake anytime we sit down at, uh, at that point, so I'll do my best uh, to bring uh, God's Word uh, to you this morning. I appreciate the opportunity from the elders to, to speak. I, I, I love the opportunity to preach. I, I come from a long line of preachers, and while I've never made it a got it into my schedule to do this full time. I, I do love the Word of God, the things that it, that it says to us. We're going to take a, take a deeper look at that this morning. So as I was preparing for this, I, I kept coming back to a couple of thoughts, and I'd read a couple of articles in the last two weeks, and one of those was about communication with God, and another one was, was in the workplace, and it was about communication uh, in the workplace, communication with your employees. And, and as I was looking at the, uh, the, the concepts there, I thought, you know, people just want to be communicated with. We want to have a clear and concise message given to us, not only at church, but, but in the workplace and at home and in our relationships. And so I, I thought, you know, what about if we would talk about a conversation uh, with God? So as I thought about what to put a, a title uh, how, how to title this sermon, it could be called, What Does God Expect From Us? But I didn't want it to go there. I, I wanted it to be more deeply personal so that we couldn't use the word us as a scapegoat to see that we're just fitting in with this herd here. So we're going to call this sermon this morning, God, What Do You Expect From Me? We're going to ask that question six times. We're going to answer that question six times uh, from the scriptures this morning, and we'll understand that if we dig in to the scripture in our conversations with God, he does speak clearly to us and tells us a variety of different things that I think can impact our lives as we we move forward. So if I ask that first question this morning, God, what do you expect from me? He says, I want you to be responsible and obedient. So it was 1984. You guys remember those little coin purses, the uh, little rubber ones that you kind of squeeze? It looks like a mouth. Well, I was supposed to be in bed taking a nap because my family was preparing for an evening out at a rodeo that was going to keep me up much past my bedtime. And I was in bed, but I wasn't asleep. And I'd somehow gotten my brother, my older brother's coin purse, and I had that at arm's length above me, and I was squeezing it. Not enough so that the money could come out, but so it could almost come out. And I was good at it. And I was getting more bold. And the bolder I got, the closer it got to coming out. And it wasn't stuffed full. It had two or three coins in it at that point in time. And as this went on, and I think I was supposed to be there for an hour, this was highly entertaining. And I was really getting into it until the fateful moment where I got too bold. It opened, and a dime shot out, hit me directly in the throat, and I swallowed it. And it was history, never to be seen again. Well, actually, not to be seen again for a few days. So my mom called the doctor, and the doctor said, this too shall pass. And it did, and everything everything worked out. But I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was doing what I wanted to be doing. And so you ask, what, what does this story from 1984 have to do with 2020? And I'm glad you asked that question, because... What my mom expected of me is really not a lot more than what God expects from us at times, and that's to be responsible and obedient. Take care of your responsibilities and that which you are tasked with, and do it diligently. Because when we do it diligently, good things happen. The Lord gives us simple tasks. Here's some examples. Be nice and be kind. Be wise with your money. Choose good friends. Keep your commitments. Be a positive influence on others. 
Faithfully attend services. Say your prayers. Do good, even when no one is looking. Study and work hard. Obey the golden rule. There's hundreds more, but I think you guys get the idea. I'm sure you filled in some of those blanks for me as we were going along there. But if you sum up these basic examples, it really starts to sound the way a responsible and obedient person would act. Now, I have an excuse for 1984. I was four years old, and four-year-olds do that kind of thing. But I ask you today, what's the excuse that you make for the way that you act when it's not becoming of a Christian? So I'll give you a few examples. Everybody else was doing it. Have you ever heard that one before? Nobody will ever find out. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal. It didn't hurt anyone. How about this one? I can stop any time that I want. The Bible doesn't specifically say that I can't do that. And once again, there's hundreds more, but I think you guys get the point that I'm trying to make here. There's a lot of scriptures that lend themselves to responsible action. Luke 16.10 says, He who is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in very little is unrighteous also in much. So the concept of, of very little can take us down the right path or it can take us down the wrong path. If you look at the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 10, and there it gives us another example of, of responsible action. In 2 Peter 1.10 it says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Practice these things. Do good. Be responsible. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and self-control. Self-control allows us to act in a responsible and obedient way. And the flip side of that is the lack of self-control allows us to act irresponsibly and to be disobedient. So you may be thinking, you know, Jason, I am responsible. I take care of the things that are asked and required of me. I don't ask others for, for help. And I do a lot of good. And folks, that may really be true. But are you doing as much good as God would have you to do? Are you fully subjected to God. So here's a couple of examples, and, and I've thrown these out because they entertain two things that probably impact everyone in this room, time and, and money. You may come up with other examples, and these ones may not impact you, but I think if we make some application, we can do that. So let me throw this out there. Matthew 5.41 asks us if we'll walk two miles with someone that forces us to go with them one. So for example... Who here has made a point to be here every Sunday night for our group studies? Most hands would go up. We've, we've, had, a, we've had a good crowd. In fact, a, a better crowd than, uh, than ordinary through that. Second question, who's read the chapter for the week so that you can meaningfully impact your class? And a lot of us would, would answer in the affirmative on that as well. Who's taken the time to answer the discussion questions ahead of time since they're available on Wednesday evenings and we've got several days to take care of that before we get to class on, on Sunday night. So I ask those questions, one, so you can answer them to yourselves, and, and two, so we can get this out of it. So the elders asked us to be here and to read the chapter. That's that first mile. The second mile is what are you willing to do to prepare yourself to make sure that that class is as meaningful as it can be for every person in it, including yourself. So what if you're a responsible adult who works has a job, takes care of your financial obligations, but you routinely come up short for contributing to the financial efforts of the church. If that's truly the case, and you're doing the best you can, then bless you for your efforts. However, if you find that dinner out, and designer clothes, and a bigger house, and new cars, and the latest electronic gadgetry keeps you from being able to contribute to the work of the kingdom, then maybe it's time to take a step back. So making the money is a requirement. That's the first mile. The second mile is up to you. So if we ask the question again, God, what do you expect from me? God says, I want you to use the word Christian as an adjective. 
So we're not going to go into a deep grammar lesson here, but we are going to talk a little bit about, uh, about adjectives. Too often we spend a lot of time doing things that keep our spiritual efforts a little to the left or the little to the right of true north spiritually. Life gets busy. We had a lot of activities going on. We have a lot of roles that we fill in life. We have a, a, a lot of responsibilities to spend time on that can tilt our priorities off of where they need to be. Just a few of those. Work, school, hobbies, sports, recreational activities, even family can take us in a spot where, where we're not where we actually need to be. So I encourage you right now to think for a moment of what you are. Ask, ask yourself, if I said, Jason... What, what am I? It's going to be several things. So you're probably an employee. You might be an employer. You might be a father, a husband, a sister, a mother, an aunt, an uncle, whatever the case may be. But think for a minute about what that is. But now if we discuss the word Christian as an adjective rather than as a noun, of course, an adjective by definition describes another word. Or if you go deeper than that, it actually modifies another word. So an adjective is a modifier of another word. So for instance, a big dog. Big is the adjective. It's modifying the dog. A red apple, a blue shirt, you guys get it. So what if we allowed the word Christian to describe, or more aptly, to modify what it is that we are? So if we suddenly become a Christian teacher, a Christian doctor, a Christian baseball player, a Christian student, a Christian mother, whatever it was that you are, put that word Christian beside it. But if we can use that word to modify what we are, then we've used that word appropriately for it to impact our lives and the lives of those that we touch on a daily basis. Because Christianity walks hand in hand with every activity that we attend to. Now here's the flip side of that. If what you are cannot have the word Christian attached to it as a modifier, guys, it's time for a a gut check at this point and recognize that we have to make some changes at that point. If what you are or what you're doing cannot be modified, if an adjective of Christian can't go hand in hand with that, it's time to take a step back. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So in verse 5 and in verse 6, there's a tiny little word in there, in both of those. It's the word all. So we've got three letters that encompasses a, a huge amount. So if I asked you what is all, you would probably give me a bigger word, and you would say everything. So if you can honestly say this morning that you're trusting in the Lord with all your heart and in all your ways you're acknowledging him, you guys are on the straight and narrow and on the right path. If not, we've got some challenges to overcome and we need to allow that word Christian to modify our activities even more than we've allowed it to uh, up to this point. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Do the things that you're supposed to do. Commit those things to the Lord. And guys, you already have a plan for life. It's already been established. So if we ask this question a third time, you have to understand that it is not about you, is what God would say. There's a lot of anecdotes anecdotes that could be used here to illustrate uh, this point. And a lot of them would resonate very strongly within many of us. Um, You see them now repeatedly on social media. Uh, There's books about them. There's different things that pop up. But but from the diner who was in a restaurant who'd recently lost his wife to cancer that looks over at a family and sees that family who's struggling with cancer as well. Obviously, the mother in that family has lost her hair from radiation. And he leaves a heartfelt note with the cashier as he pays for their meal and exits quietly, not wanting any notoriety of his own. He simply wanted to do a kind and gentle deed for someone else. To the story that I shared with some of you here recently about a time when I was working down in Dallas, Texas, and I went through a drive through and as I approached the, uh, the drive through window, the uh, cashier leaned out to me and said, Sir, um, 
your meal has already been taken care of by the car in front of you. I said, well, that's really nice. And she said, it is nice. Would you like to do it for the people behind you? This has been going on for about two hours. And I did. To the many stories of people in grocery store checkout counters who are running just a little bit short on things and some good Samaritan behind them steps up and makes sure that their kids don't have to want for things because they have the means to do it. Or in one story that I read, they didn't have the means to do it, but they figured out a way to make it happen because they were more able than that person sitting there. To people who've, who've lost loved ones and had others step in and take care of financial obligations and expenses at that point in time of their greatest need. To people who had one desperate need after desperate need after another and were taken care of by people that love them or maybe even more touching by people that just simply love people. We need to be like that. So society calls these random acts of kindness. But whatever you choose to call them, I think we can all agree that when they are done right with the purity of heart to help someone else, they make it very clear to me that it is not about me at that point in time. It's about someone else. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25... Verses 37 through 40, it says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do we have the compassion, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness, the patience that we have for others? So we can honestly say when we step back and take a good hard look at things that it's, it's clearly not about me. It's about others and what the kingdom of God can do for them. But having this mindset allows us to, to bless people when we have the opportunity. So while it's not necessarily planned, these type of acts become less and less random because practice makes perfect, and we get better at this the more we make the effort to make it happen. So if we ask this question a fourth time, God says you're called to praise and worship me, no matter what. You know, there are a lot of times that it's easy to praise God. Things are, are going really well for us. Uh, we have daily reminders of his glory. Some of you are just back, as I mentioned earlier, from affirming the faith, and there's no better time to feel like you're on a, a spiritual mountaintop than when you're surrounded by a thousand other Christians singing songs of praise, and your mind's in a really great spot. A couple of months from now, Kids are going to be heading to the camp. Staff is going to be heading to camp. Once again, another mountaintop experience. There's a ladies' day coming up this weekend. You'll be immersed in the Word, surrounded by other women of like uh, thoughts and, and like minds, working on a common goal. And you can think of all these different activities that take place. But unfortunately, life isn't always like that. We have to come back from affirming the faith. And we're going to leave here today, and we're going to go back into the world tomorrow. We're going to go to work, and we're going to go to school, and we're going to go back to our regular routines. And those aren't as easy to stay focused at times on things as it is right here in this worship service this morning. So I, I think the challenge for us here is that when calamity strikes, when tests come along that we aren't sure that we can withstand, how do we make that our priority still to worship God? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, says very simply to us, Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So I'll call your attention back to a couple of words mentioned in there. Light affliction. And if we take that out of context, it doesn't necessarily work for us right here. But if we look at it in the context of how this scripture was written, guys, light affliction is everything that we face on this earth. So all the things that get in the way of us worshiping God constantly and doing that, that's light affliction. You've heard the old saying, don't sweat the small stuff, everything's small stuff. That's like this right here. So we've got a bill that we're having trouble paying. We've got a difficult relationship that we're having to work through. We've got a leg that hurts. We've got a car that's broken down. We've got all these different challenges that put stumbling blocks into our, into our way. As we've got to hurdle those stumbling blocks and recognize that if we really take a look at it and really recognize the example that was set for us, that we can get over these things. There's a singing group called Casting Crowns, and they sing a song called I'll Praise You in This Storm. And, and I love that song, and the chorus in that song says, I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands, that you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. And, and we're asked to do that, whatever that storm of life is, whether it's physical challenges, financial challenges, relational challenges, you guys fill in the blank on what personal challenge you're having at this point in time, but that can't step between us and our Lord and Savior. We can't allow it to do that. So you ask, well, how do I get beyond that? And I think a lot of things in life are about the proper perspective. There are those of us who nothing ever stops us and nothing ever gets us down. Whatever challenge comes up, we, we look at it as a challenge and we're going to conquer that next challenge. And there are even those that do that in every aspect of life, but not in their spiritual life. We've got to be that overcomer that makes certain that no matter what challenge gets in our way. To give you a few examples here this morning, you'll see the scripture on the board behind me, John 3.16. Now that's a challenge right there. God loved us enough that he gave us his son so we would have eternal life challenge for God that blesses us. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. More giving more forgiving, more willing to do whatever it took to give us an opportunity for eternal salvation. And we have that same concept in our lives that nothing gets in the way of praise and worship. So if we ask this question a fifth time, God would say to us, I want focused action. When Eli first started playing baseball, he had a, a terrible habit of wanting the perfect pitch. He wanted it belt high and right down the middle. But most pitchers are taught not to throw it belt high and right down the middle, so you guys can see the challenge we've got here. So Eli spent a lot of time waiting for that perfect pitch, and that caused a lot of challenges for him because those pitches that hit the low and outside corner or the high and inside corner, they're not easy to hit, and he wouldn't swing the bat. And he struck out looking a lot. So I had a talk with him. I was his coach, and, and I said, Eli, bud, we, we've got to step back here and, and analyze this, and sometimes you've got to take a swing at pitches you can hit rather than pitches that are the perfect pitch. I said, even the best hitters strike out from time to time but they're going to strike out swinging. It should be really the exception to the rule for us to strike out looking. He was bobbing his head up and down in agreement with me through this whole, this whole thing. And uh, I said it's really not acceptable for us to 
submit and, and strike out looking. I said, you got it? He said, I got it, all right. So I said, let's recap this. What are you going to do from now on? And with quite a bit of gusto, Eli says, I'm going to strike out swinging. <laughs> and I said, no, you're going to hit the ball, but if you strike out, then you're going to strike out swinging. He got it. He doesn't strike out swinging or looking near as much as he once did. He's matured that way. But the challenge that we have as Christians and even as adults is that we miss out on so much waiting for the perfect pitch. We miss out on so much waiting for the person who wants to come to church and recognizes that they have a need instead of the opportunity that presents itself probably every day at work to have a conversation Every day in some type of recreational activity to have a conversation. Every step you take each day to be the example that you need to be. The perfect pitch doesn't come along very often. When it does, you've got to be primed and ready to hit it out of the park. But more often than not, we're going to have to live our life on taking a walk here and there. Hitting a single. Striking out occasionally and getting up and being ready to to do it again. But when we talk about focused action... It brings me to the thoughts in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, which says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone will, may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Focused action, as we're discussing here, is faith with works. Having the knowledge... An appliant can do great work for the kingdom of God, but sitting idly by without action to support your knowledge gets nobody anywhere fast. Jesus tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So you could wrap that up and say, if you're sitting there on the fence waiting for the perfect pitch to come by, you're going to miss out so much miss out on so much of life that comes by and so many opportunities to do things for the kingdom of God that we won't do if we're just sitting there. God gives us gifts, and God expects us to use them. Turn with me to the book of Romans. We've been studying Romans this quarter in the the young adult class. And Romans chapter 12 Uh, piqued my interest as I was uh, thinking about this when I talk about focused action. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. And it says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy... With cheerfulness. Every one of us in here can agree that there are a number of gifts not mentioned there. And you can look to the right and the left of you, and you can look at somebody that has a similar gift to you, and you can look at somebody that doesn't have that similar gift. So while the list isn't comprehensive, it should get it started, and it should get the creative juices flowing, and it should let us understand that the gifts that God has given us, we're being asked to use those gifts. We're being asked to take focused action to drive things forward. Are you using your gifts? Maybe step back. Do you know what your gifts are? Are you willing to find out and step outside your comfort zone? Do you recognize that God requires action from us and focus from us so that our benefits aren't kept hidden away, so that our gifts aren't kept hidden away and that they provide benefits uh, to others? That would be my challenge to you today, as we just read in Romans, to identify what your gifts are, what you can do, how you can help, where you can go, what you can be, to make things happen, so that you can discover it, cultivate it, and ultimately use it for God's glory. If we ask the sixth, the same question for the sixth and final time, God says, I want your Absolute best. Not your leftovers. Not a little bit of effort. In 2006, there was a movie made called Facing the Giants. Some of you have seen that. 
Some of you have, and if you haven't, I strongly recommend that you watch it. If you have, I strongly recommend that you watch it again. It's a great movie. There's a scene, a particular scene in the movie called the death crawl scene. Some of you know what the death crawl is. You're an athlete or a former athlete, and it's indelibly marked on your mind, and you wake up with night sweats because of it. In this movie, the death crawl is a, you're on all fours, but your knees aren't some of the fours. It's your toes and your hands. And you're crawling from the goal line to the 20-yard line. But in this particular scene, Coach Grant Taylor is having a conversation with his team, and one of, the, one of the young men asks, hey, what do you think about this team coming up? And before anybody can answer it, one of the captains on the team, Brock Kelly, says, well, they're a whole lot better than us. And the coach just immediately jumps into the middle of him and says, have you already given up? Have we already lost the game? And he said, no, but I mean, I'd have more hope if I thought we could actually win. And coach calls him out on it and stands him up in front of the team. And he says, what am I, am I in trouble? And coach says, not yet. And all the other players are standing in the background and they're chuckling and, and, and laughing at this situation. He says, hey, I want you to do the death crawl again, but I want you to go farther this time. And he says, what, you want me to go to the 30? 10 yards farther than he'd been initially asked to do. And coach says, I think you can go to the 50. And he says, you know, I could probably go to the 50 with nobody on my back, because they actually have a person that sits on their back and adds weight to this situation. And coach says, I think you can go to the 50 with somebody on your back. And he says, I'll try. And he says, are you going to give me your best? Yeah. He says, I want to know, are you going to give me your best? And he says, yeah, I will. He says, all right, here's another trick. And he takes out another twist out of his pocket, and he puts a blindfold on him. He said, why are you blindfolding me? He says, because I don't want you to give up because you've passed a certain milestone that you believe is far enough. So he blindfolds him, and he gets down, and he gets a young man on his back, and he takes off. And as this, as this scenario unfolds, the coach is standing up beside him, and he's, he's going, and he finally says, this has got to be at least to the 20. And he says, you've got a few more steps. Just keep going, a few more steps. And he gets to about the 30, and he stops. Doesn't go down, but he stops. And coach says, don't give up on me now. Don't give up on me now. He says, I'm not quitting, I'm just tired. My arms, my arms are tired. He says, all right, dig a little deeper. Dig down a little bit more. And this continues on, and it continues on. And I don't have the music and the special effects to help you with this, but I hope you're getting the understanding of, of what's happening here. And we can't see exactly where we're at on the field because everything ceases to exist except for the coach and his player who's crawling along right there. And occasionally they flash back to the boys that were fooling around in the back and suddenly a couple of them are standing up thinking, what am I seeing here? What's, what's happening here? What's, what's going on? And they continue on. And Brock Kelly starts to yell in pain. He says, my arms are on fire. I can't go much further. And coach is saying, don't give up on me. Give me your absolute best. And this continues on. And he goes further and further and further. And at some point, Brock starts to shake almost uncontrollably as he takes one step after another, after another. And it gets more and more serious and deeper into the plot of the movie, and Coach is finally down on his level, crawling along beside him, yelling encouragement. Don't give up on me now. Give me your absolute best. Are you giving me your absolute best? 30 more steps, 20 more steps, 10 more steps. Finally gets to the point, he says, one more step. And Brock takes that one last step and collapses across the end zone, 100 yards from where he started, from a young man that said that I can probably make it to the 50 without anybody on my back, when he carried a 160-pound man plus himself on all fours all the way through that. How often do we quit? How often do we give up before we get there? How often do we say, that's enough? And we cease to push as hard as we can. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord, 
rather than for men. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy 4.7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Everybody in this room today is a really long ways from finishing the course. But back to the example, when things get hard and the proverbial arms start to shake and the sweat's flowing and there's a blindfold across your eyes and you can't tell you where you're at and there's weight on your back and you're not sure if you can keep it and we don't necessarily have somebody cheering us on down in our ear yelling at us 30 more steps, 20 more steps, 10 more steps. How do we persevere? Once again, I think we go back to perspective and recognize that there's nothing that we will face on this earth more difficult than what our Savior faced for us. The challenges that he went through and rose above because of his love for us impacts us and impact people as much then as it should us today. So if we ask this question one last time, God, what is it that you expect of me? I think there could be a lot more answers than the ones that I've submitted to you this morning. I've given you six. You guys may have one or two or three or four or five or six of these that impacted you immediately. You may need to come up with your own because I didn't hit the nail on the head for you personally. But what I'm throwing out there this morning is the scripture speaks plainly to us. And tells us what God would have, not us, but what God would have you do when he asked that question. He wants us to be responsible and obedient. We have to use the word Christian as an adjective. We've got to understand that it is not about us. You're called to praise and worship him, as am I, no matter what, all the time. He wants our focused action. And as we just talked, he wants our absolute best. If you can respond in the affirmative to each of these, it's fantastic. Someday, you'll hear the words spoken in Matthew 25, 21, and I can't think of sweeter words than that. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. But challenges pop up in our way. Things hit us right square between the eyes. We lose our focus. We're sitting out there waiting for that sweet spot pitch, and it never comes. And excuses creep in. So if any of these challenges are an area that you need to work on this morning, the church here stands ready to pray with you and for you. Maybe you've got several of them down pat, as I said, but maybe you've got some that you still need to work on. Maybe you haven't put our Lord on in baptism. That is available for you as well this morning. But whatever your need is, please come as we stand and sing. We stand and sing. We stand and sing. We stand and sing.